Hi, this is Chris Howard from the Plugged In with Chris Howard podcast, and I'm taking the Denver Nuggets over the Timberwolves in their game Wednesday, January 18th. Bet Online has free odds and lines available online or on your mobile device. Visit BetOnline.net today. The following program is a Podcast One.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. I'm talking to Jim Cornette here on the Steve Austin Show. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And I just wanted to shoot the shit a little bit with Jim, and I'm going to tell Stacy to leave this shit in the show. Uh, God dang, uh, Jim, this is the Unleashed Show. Everything flies on this show. Let, let, gonna, let, me, let me say let me say this let me say this we we not only we did a two-hour podcast and and the technical problems came up and we've had like what two or three hour plus phone calls in the last couple of weeks that would have made good podcasts if we recorded them so now we're recording this and hopefully everything's going to work and this will probably suck it will probably be boring so no, no, no. You know, th- this ain't going to be boring because i you know i just want to start off with oh no let's go back to the other show because man we talk for uh two hours and it's some good good shit in there and when i got that thing back and you know my gal sent me an email that you know i can only hear the parts of jim Cornette. you were not on the show and what had happened was skype was stopped supporting third party recorders or whatever the, the one that i was using and so it didn't record nothing that i said it recorded shit you said it didn't record a goddamn thing i said i mean so it, it, you would think that it would at least recorded me and not you but it was vice versa, and it don't make a fuck anyway because half of a conversation was half of a conversation. Yeah. And my gal said, well, you know, I can go in there if you can re- go in there and kind of, you know, just re-ask your questions on your recorder, and I can double them in because my gal is just the best in the world at splicing stuff together and making chicken salad out of chicken shit, which is what she does with every single one of my shows. But it just wouldn't have had the same feel to it because of the way we talk. Right. It it wouldn't have had the flow. And, and you know, the, the thing is, is, is that you, you called me a couple of days afterwards. And I, I, the first thing I said was, how you doing, Steve? And you said, well, I'm pretty fucking shitty. And I was like, uh oh. <laughs> and I actually said as a joke, I said, don't tell me the show got erased. And you said, well, half of it did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so, <laughs> someone someone told me I was telling uh, telling someone what happened. They said, "Well, hell, man, just just Cornet's half of a conversation would have made a great podcast." I said, "Well, like, I was like, well, you know what? You probably have a point there. I should have just <laughs> spliced all his shit together and just let it fly." <laughs> Well, it would have been less work, but hey, it gives us an, uh, uh, an excuse to talk again for however long about a bunch of old wrestling and, and tell bullshit stories and potentially, you know, what, what was the James Garner line in the movie Sunset? It's all true, give or take a lie or two. Give or take a lie or two. Hey, man, before we get cranked up just shooting the shit, and that's all this, we're going to call this motherfucker in the ring, Jim. I don't have any notes in front of me. I have my laptop computer in my lap, and I've got uh, the books that you sent me right in front of me, and I've been glancing through those. But I wanted to, to, to at least just first, let's talk about the Jim Cornette experience, your podcast. What the fuck's going on? Well, you know, actually, we've been doing it, uh, I guess, for about six or seven weeks now. It's on MLW Radio, and you can go to MLW.com. Court Bauer, who uh, has run his own promotion, Major League Wrestling, and also spent some time working for the Evil Empire, writing for Vince McMahon. Um, he uh, he had me as a guest on one of his podcasts that uh, with Conan. Uh, uh, several, a couple of months ago and, and, and got great feedback on it and and called me and asked me, said, Hey, would you like to do a podcast? And people have been asking if I would do it. And, and I'm just so technically illiterate, uh, that I hadn't done it up till now, but I said to court it, as I always tell everybody, if you'll do all the work, I'll take all the credit. So <laughs> we've, uh, we've started that and it, it goes up, uh, every Thursday morning and it's available for a week on MLW.com. The Jim Cornette Experience, and uh, we talk about a little of everything. We talk a lot of old wrestling. We talk about bullshit. I've just, I've actually uh, just successfully waged a campaign to get Seth MacFarlane to realize the error of his ways and bring Brian Griffin back to Family Guy. And sure enough, for the Christmas episode, there it was. So the cult of Cornette, all my followers on Twitter at the Jim Cornette, and the people that listen to my podcast, the Jim Cornette Experience, I, I marshaled those forces, Steve. The the com- combined power of all my millions and millions of of followers uh brought finally 
Brian Griffin has come back to Family Guy. And, and so that's just a, an example of the public service that I perform every week on MLW.com on the Jim Cornette Experience. As original, as, as, as one and only and as original as you are, that sounded a little bit plagiarized. Well, you know, here's the thing. I've always said when you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. When you steal from many, it's research. And what I do is I just steal everybody's shit. I told Jerry Lawler one time, I said, I've made more money with your material in the wrestling business than you have. And uh, I think he liked it. I'm not sure. Hey, man, so when, when you go to talk to your cats, I mean, how much kind of uh, research t- uh, time are you putting into all this? Well, you know, I, I, I jot down things. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an obsessive note taker because um, I got the OCD, and it comes from years of being in the wrestling business, keeping track of my bookings, keeping track of my finishes, uh, years of booking. I write everything down, so I just I jot things down that strike me funny or, or you know, maybe not funny, maybe serious, but I jot things down and I retain things, and I'm, I'm like Michael Hayes also. I steal a lot of lines for, for promos from popular music. You know, why not? But, um, you know, I, I try to approach it as seriously as possible because we want to give the people a good show but at the same time a lot of it's just like what we're doing calling it in the ring because when you're talking to somebody that uh that is just is kind of a naturally entertaining motherfucker like you are uh you know you don't need to to sit there and and put words in people's mouth and that's we we've talked about it before (laughs) nobody heard it but we talked about it that that, uh you know that's why sometimes these days wrestling seems to be homogenized and sanitized and pasteurized for your protection, sort of like the that paper wrapper on the Super 8 toilet seat, uh, <laughs> you know, where where it's not really the guy's true personality shining through. And, and I, we always encourage that. So a lot of it's just, hey, what comes up, comes up. And, you know. You try to keep your shows about an hour length? Yeah. It, it, also, you don't have to spend your life, uh, you know, on this. I mean, uh, uh, sometimes podcasts go for – quantity instead of quality and 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 we do about an hour each week and then there's vip content you can sign up for if you just can't get enough of us uh (laughs) but uh (laughs) but yeah we we try to keep it you know get in get out and keep it moving and uh that's that's a good wrestling match and hey that's a good podcast that's almost that's almost everything in life including sex get in and get out and don't let it get dragged you know you're 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 a creative wonder and you, you like doing this kind of shit so are you enjoying the podcast endeavor is it more time intensive than you thought it would be or it just goes with the uh with the territory well, no, I, yeah, I am enjoying it because, uh, you know, especially I hadn't got into the Twitter thing until just recently. I've had a Twitter account, but my wife set it up because she got mad because somebody stole Jim Cornette at Jim Cornette. It was a fake guy. Don't that piss you off. And, and well, you know, and, and she says, hey, I'm going to call Twitter. So she calls or she writes Twitter or whatever. And they said, well, if you can prove that this person is not. And she said, hey, why, why do I have to prove that my husband is my husband when this motherfucker didn't have to prove that he was even to get the account. Right. So right. she put it at the Jim Cornette and, uh, and I don't know how to use these smartphones. So she, every once in a while we're riding in the car and she'd say, well, so-and-so said such and such. And I said, well, Twitter back this. And so I, it was like a dictation thing. And then finally she put a thing on my computer. She said, here, click this. If you want to Twitter, cause she got tired of me. Yeah. And, uh, and so now I'm doing it. I'm having fun with it. It's great interaction with the fans. And, uh, so I've, I'm doing the Twitter thing and, and with the podcast, you know, we're having fun with it because it's a way to, to talk to your fans and to get the, you know, the word out about things that you're doing and, and, uh, just get your opinions out there. And I'm gratified that people enjoy it and, and I get great feedback. It's funny or it's thought provoking or whatever, much like I'm sure, you know, you do. And also at this point in our lives, I may not be quite as successful as you are. My movies aren't coming out, uh, you know, every fucking week like Stone Cold's are. But at the same time, I can I can sit here at the Castle Cornet in uh, on the outskirts of Louisville, Kentucky, and broadcast my wisdom to the world. So how can you beat that, especially for a egotistical son of a bitch like I am? You know, I started my Twitter account a couple of years ago, and I remember, uh, I guess I was living out in Los Angeles, and I remember when Twitter first came out, and I started reading about it as a social media thing. And when you to send a message, it is called a tweet. And I, I always thought to myself, man, fuck that. I'm going to send a tweet. You know, I kind of like a, I'm kind of like, you know, figure myself one of those macho motherfuckers. You know, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. send no fucking tweet. So anyway, a couple of years went by and I said, you know what? 
Uh, I don't hardly do anything out there in Los Angeles. I live out there because, you know, I can take a meeting. It's pretty handy, and I love the goddamn weather. So anyway, you know, it ain't like I got to live in L.A., but I, w since I am out there, I don't do fuck all. I'm not, I don't go try to get my picture taken by TMZ and, and say I'm going to be here and all that other bullshit. So, I, But I need some way to maintain some type of communication with my fan base. And so I started mine a couple years ago. And I fall in love with it. And, you know, I try to read every single mention that I can and go over my tweets every day. And I try to stay active in it and uh, promote all my stuff. But I just enjoy talking to the people. And, you know, cats like you and me, you and me are basically in the same uh, age category. And you and me have been going down the road for a long ass time. And now talking about these smartphones. You remember back in the day, Jim, back when we was first getting out on the road, man, we didn't even have no fucking cell phones. If you want to stop and make a call... You stopped at a truck stop at Denny's or, you know, Waffle yeah, House, whatever. Yeah. You got your ass on a payphone and you started dropping uh, quarters in that motherfucker. Or you call somebody collect or the high rollers had a calling card. So you just put your number in and talk to a son of bitch. Times have changed since we've been on the road. Would you have ever figured it would have come as far? Oh, well, I, I've said many times, every interview I've ever done, if there were cell phones in the 80s, nobody in the wrestling business would have been married longer than six weeks. And I mean, you know, and think about this, you used to leave home and, and drive somewhere with, with some of your friends, 400, 500 miles in a car. And, and you'd tell, okay, honey, I'll, I'll be back at four in the morning. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Dennis Condry, uh, and Dennis Condry about the Twitter thing, he had a great line. He said, you know, I don't understand this Twitter thing. He said, because as I sit here right here, right now, I don't give a fuck what anybody in the world is doing and don't know why they would think that way about me. But Dennis actually in, in the olden days, and he, not to the lovely lady that he's married to now and has been for 20 years, but in his previous life in the wrestling business, sometimes even if he was off, he would take his bag, leave home. <laughs> He'd go do whatever he was going to do. He would stop at a gas station bathroom, wet his tights down, and come back about 3 in the morning with a wet <laughs> bag of tights. And That hey, was a hard one tonight, baby. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's what you used to be able to get away with because you, you, you literally were incommunicado to the rest of the world from the time you left home till the time you got to the building and from the time you left the building till the time you got back. And it, it was the Wild West. When did you first get your first cell phone? Because uh, I know you, you couldn't have been like, I, I, you know, back when those uh, first cell phones came out there, size of a fucking brick. And that was the rich folks had that phone. So I never had one of those. What was your first cell phone? When did you get oh, that God, motherfucker? Well, I remember the, the ones the size of a brick because Paul E. Dangerously, Paul Heyman, yeah. hit his head with one <laughs> in 1988 and crossed my eyes. I bled like a stuck hog on TBS, and not all of that was, was self-inflicted, I'll tell you that. Benny but, Hardway, you with the cell phone. Well, I, you know, I, but I told him to. I said, hit me over the head with this, motherfucker, because one thing that Paul E. would do is sometimes he'd hold up, especially he wanted to try to throw an artful punch, and his punches <laughs> – Look like shit. And I said, just hit me in the side of the head. Don't hit me in the face. Hit me in the side of the head and hit me hard because elsewise we're, none of it we're backing up here. But to answer your question, um, I guess it was probably about 90, 96 when I moved up to 96, 97 when I got up to Stanford and was working in the office and, you know, had to be in contact with people. I got the first cell phone and and I've, you know, never enjoyed them. Uh, I've, I've got bad hearing. I got hit by lightning when I was on a, a landline one time. <laughs> hey, man, you were you telling know. me that story the other day about your hearing not being so good in one ear. What happened when you got hit by lightning? I mean, I mean, I, it's a stupid question to ask. I mean, but what the fuck happened to you? What did that feel like? Well, I'll tell you, I was in, I was living in my house in, in Morristown, Tennessee, outside of Knoxville. I was running Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and I was, I was on the phone when a thunderstorm came up one day, and I was talking to the widow of the late Whitey Caldwell, the all-time top babyface of East Tennessee Wrestling, getting her to come to the Night of the Legends show to accept an award and everything, and the thunderstorm is raging outside, and suddenly lightning hit my house, and at the same time, not only did all the power go out, it fried one of my TVs and fried my refrigerator, blew some of the, the light bulbs and the lights, but also it was like somebody had fired a gun off next to my head and punched me in the side of the head at the same time. And I went over on the couch and the phone flew up. And the next thing that I was aware of was walking around in a circle in my, in my office, dazed, and my ears were ringing. And all the power was off, and I said, well, I guess i got to go to the town now. And I just jumped in the car and went to the town. And it wasn't long after that I discovered that 
uh, I have I have good hearing in a quiet room, right. but I, my left ear is my better ear. My right ear, which was the opposite one that was on the phone, is not good. And if I'm in a crowded, loud situation, I cannot discern one sound from another. So if I'm at a bar or I'm at a loud place and somebody's talking to me, I just generally, if they're smiling, I smile and nod because I can't hear fuck Dude, all. that's the same thing I do. I always get, a bunch, get some people they want to meet at some loud-ass restaurant for a damn meeting, and I can't hear a goddamn thing. It's the same thing. You know, if everybody's laughing, I'll do the same thing. Or, you know, I'll just tap out. I won't say a goddamn thing. I'll just sit there and eat my food. And, you know, say, hey, man, I told you guys, I said, I can't hear a motherfucking thing. If you want to meet somewhere quiet, I'll fucking chip in this thing. But I can't hear. So I got to be in a quiet place if you want to talk yeah. business. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and it's funny, Bobby Fulton of the Fantastics. Um, one time we were having a match. Uh, gosh, I guess it was for an Atlanta TV taping, WCW taping. And and some way or another, he and Bobby Bobby Eaton got screwed up on a spot coming off the turnbuckles, and Bobby Eaton landed on his head, landed on Bobby Fulton's head, that is, and come back in the locker room, and, and Bobby Fulton went up and thanked Bobby Eaton, said thank you, and Bobby said, for what? He said, well, really, he said, I haven't been able to hear out of that ear in the past couple of years, and, and some bitch, when you landed on my head, my hearing popped back in. <laughs> <laughs> was he shooting? He was shooting. Oh, God. Hey, let's talk about the Fantastics for a second. I don't think a, a lot of people give those guys the credit they deserve. They, man, those guys, uh, Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton was a hellacious tag team. Oh, th- they were tremendous in the ring. And, and you know, it, it, it wasn't a situation where with the Rock and Roll Express, you had Ricky Morton, who was always the guy that sold. And you had Robert Gibson, yep. who was always the guy that made the comeback. And that was what they were better with. And, 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 and it worked for them. But with, with Bobby and Tommy, they were more similar. And they, you could, each one of them could sell their ass off. Yep. And, I, you know, I, Bobby Fulton's been one of my friends since way before I got into, into business. And, and, you know, he was an underneath guy, and I was a photographer, and he used to ride with, with me and my mom because he didn't have, you know, he was an underneath wrestler back in those days and didn't have the money to get to the towns. But, um, you know, Tommy was more athletic. I always joked to Bobby. I said, Bobby, you don't weigh but 210 pounds every time that I have to wrestle. I, I pick Tommy up. He goes right up, and you're the heaviest guy since Bruiser Brody. I can't slam you to save my life. But – they were great workers and great athletes and and actually as far as um <laughs> as far as as technically having a, being great workers they were better athletic workers and 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 had better teamwork than the rock and roll express it's just that the, the rock and roll had had Ricky's incredible selling and had Robert's comebacks and and they got places first so they got the the lion's share of the notoriety and we made a lot a lot more money with them but I would say the Midnight and Fantastics matches technically and in the ring were even better than the Midnight and the Rock and Roll matches. And that's not, you know, not downgrading anybody, just stating a fact. The hey, Fantastics was, never got their due. Where was Tommy Rogers and Bobby Fulton from? Because you said you was uh, childhood for, or friends from back before the business. Where was Bobby Fulton from? Bobby, uh, Bobby's from Chillicothe, Ohio, and he started working at the time. They didn't call it independent wrestling. They called it outlaw wrestling. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the recognized territory in the area, but he started as an outlaw wrestler when he was 16 years old, I guess. And, and, and worked, you know, in, in that cap- capacity for three or four years till finally he got a spot with, uh, Jerry Jarrett in, in the Memphis territory. And, Tommy Rogers uh, also actually was, I believe he's originally from Florida. He lives out in Hawaii now, so he's smarter than all What's of us. What's he doing out there? Um, sitting on the beach, as far as I know, man. You know, uh, his his work caught up with him for a while. I believe he had a hip replacement, and uh, he hadn't wrestled in quite a while. But but Tommy was from Florida, and he got into business uh, in the early 80s. And Bobby had been uh, wrestling since he was a teenager in the late 70s, and you know, Bobby and Tommy Rogers were not the original Fantastics. Now, here's a little trivia for you. Great. Um, what happened was Bobby Fulton was working in Memphis when uh, uh, Bill Dundee lost one of his power plays with Jerry Lawler. Lawler took the book, and, and Dundee had to go away for a while. And Jerry Jarrett had been talking to Ole Anderson down in Georgia. And all these Georgia towns were on it on their ass. This was 1983 because they were concentrating on their northern tours in Ohio and Michigan off of TBS. And 
So anyway, Ole made a deal with Jared Jarrett. Send me a crew down to Atlanta, and they're gonna they're gonna run my Georgia towns. We'll we'll do a studio TV in Chattanooga, and they'll run Chattanooga and Knoxville and Augusta and Macon and you know all the Georgia towns, right? Columbus. And um, so uh, the fab, the fabulous ones, Stan Lane and Steve Kern, were such a hot team. God damn, they were a great Memphis. tag team too. Yeah. Oh, they were tremendous, and they'd gotten over so well that that uh, basically uh, Jerry sent uh, Bill Dundee down to be the Booker, and sent Bobby Fulton and Terry Taylor down to be the Fantastic Ones, ah. which was a rip off of the Fabulous Ones, ah. <laughs> and sent me down to be the top manager. I was all of nine months in the business. I'm going to be the top heel manager, and I'm going to manage the Angel Frank Morell and Norman Frederick Charles III, who was an old royal kangaroo, hadn't wrestled in several years, but was an old friend of Dundee's from Australia, and Jerry Lawler's cousin Carl Fergie. And uh, the bounty hunter, Jerry Novak, that was the heel crew. And we had Coco Ware for a little while and Steve-O and a few guys. And, and I've, you know, we, we – and actually, it was great. We did tremendous business. In six weeks, we doubled the houses from nothing to next to nothing. <laughs> 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 and then finally, Ole came in one day. We were shooting promos at TBS for this, this off-brand fucking circuit. And Ole came in. And it's it's the only – actually, the, the, the first time I'd ever been fired, but I didn't feel like that I was fired because his exact quote was, don't do this anymore. And Dundee said, what, you mean the promos? He said, no, the whole territory. <laughs> <laughs> he closed the whole territory down after six weeks and said this was a bad idea. But when you took a bunch of guys that, that the Georgia fans had never heard of, and all of a sudden, they replaced the Georgia wrestling superstars with this little studio TV taped in front of 30 fans in Chattanooga at Channel 3. Uh, you know, it, it, that's what you got. So, But it was a great experience, learning experience for me, uh, only being nine months in the business and, and only having worked Memphis to go down and be the top guy. I was, I was, the, I was the, the top heel manager in a phone booth. And it was great experience. And, and uh, you know, Frank Morell was, was my teacher. You remember Frank from... Well, from when when I came to USWA, he was refereeing at the time. Yeah, he had had a wrestling career for like 25 years at that point. And then he, you know, he retired into the referee role. But, you know, he I rode with him and Dundee and Ronnie West, the great referee from Georgia yep. for so many years, and, and learned so much. I mean, Frank Morell one time said to me, he said... I was complaining because, oh, God, you know, we're going to go all this way and we're only going to make $50. He said, boy, you ever seen $50 worth of ham and eggs on a plate? Well, okay, point taken. Another time it was 100 degrees in a rec center building somewhere, and I said, well, maybe I'll just go out without my jacket on. He said, kid, if it's too hot to wear your gimmick, it's too hot to work. He was, just, he was full of that, yeah. and, and I was able to, to learn some of these things from these guys that had been everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Hey, you brought up Ole Anderson's name a while ago. <clears throat> Ole was a rough, gruff, tough son of a bitch. And when I passed through WCW, I got along just great with him. I really enjoyed uh, Ole. <clears throat> and, of course, watching him in a tag match, I didn't get a, uh, a chance to catch a whole lot of Gene and Ole, but I caught, I caught a whole lot of Ole and Arn, one of my favorite tag teams of all time. What was your relationship, what was your relationship like with Ole Anderson? Well, you know, Ole, not only was he a gruff son of a bitch and, and wrestling's original grumpy old man, but all, he was incredibly intelligent, right? Uh, incredibly well-spoken. Uh, he was dedicated to the wrestling business, and he was very straight-laced with it. And as a matter of fact, my favorite Ole Anderson, one of the nicest things that anybody ever said to me, Ole said, you know, Cornette, one time, I said, I, I used to think you were a dumb fuck, but so many other dumb fucks have come along that that are worse than you, that you've moved up the ladder without doing anything. Um, <laughs> Ole and I got off on a rocky start because Dundee had done a deal at in that Georgia territory in the summer of 83 where my rich mother had sent my, my poodle Fifi down because I'd never had, you know, Fifi had never had a birthday without me being along, you know, with her. And we had a birthday party for Fifi. And this actually... 
this videotape, I, I've got a shameless plug at jimcornette.com. If you go and you look up the rook, my rookie year video, this video is available. <laughs> like seven people saw this fucking show, <laughs> but I've preserved it. We had a birthday party with all my heels wearing the hats and blowing the noisemakers. We had a cake. And of course, the, the fantastic ones, Bobby Fulton and Terry Taylor came out and put my face in the cake. And Ole came from the real straight laced, you know, the Carolinas where there wasn't a lot of comedy and there wasn't a lot of bullshit and wrestling and they didn't do a lot of outrageous things and you know he remembered the nick gulas days from tennessee where nick was a notoriously bad payoff man and and they did a lot of hoo-ha he didn't understand the tennessee wrestling philosophy and we're in chattanooga after all so it's tennessee so first time i met Oli, <laughs> and i'm a young kid but i was still a smart ass and i said Oli, it's nice to meet you and i shook his hand and he said yeah you had the the birthday party for the dog on my television. I said, yeah, I saved you a piece of cake. He said, really? I said, yeah, it's in my ear. (laughs) And uh, so, you know, Ole and I had a star-crossed relationship until finally he got a begrudging respect, I think, for me because he enjoyed zingers. He liked verbally jousting with people. And if you could stand up and trade with him verbally, he got a little bit of respect for you. So one time after the Great American Bash of 86, we're working for Crockett and we're in the locker room in Huntington, West Virginia. And Ole, you know, had gotten his check and I, we, we'd all gotten our checks for the bash. And um, I think his check for the 14 bashes was like $17,500 and mine was like 22000 because we were figured in a little bit, right. you know, stronger with the midnight and the rock and roll and the road wars and et cetera. And he said, he said, you know, God damn, it's a sorry state of affairs. When I've spent all my life trying to uphold the honor of wrestling and working all my life and blah, blah, blah. For, and we'd worked against Baby Doll. That was the thing. Six man's me against Baby Doll. And he said, it's a sorry state of affairs when a, a bitch and a fat manager make more money than I do. And I said, well, to be honest with you, Oli, I said, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you right here and right now for paving the way in the wrestling business so that I could come in and make more money than you did. <laughs> you well, God damn it. The thing about Oli was he was one of the best customers I've ever talked to. He just uses the same standard words that we all use, but for some reason, coming out of his mouth, it's pure platinum. Well, it was like the, you know, the father on the Christmas story. He worked in profanity the way other people work in oils. Um, and, and, and that's the thing is, is um, you know, only despite the profanity, he, he was, like I said, an incredibly intelligent guy. Real and smart. He, he could make his point, but he, he punctuated the points in profanity to be alliterative so that uh, so that the the guys would would listen to it at the same time. He was making a very intelligent point, but he was making sure that they listened to it. And, uh, you know, that was and and plus one of the great promo men of all time still to this day, the, the promo that he did on Atlanta TV on TBS after he turned on Dusty Rhodes in the cage in the Omni, which I was at that match and there were literally fans trying to climb the cage to get into it, to get it at the Andersons. Um, you know, that was one of the great promos that I used to give the guys in Ohio Valley wrestling tapes of to say, if you want to draw money verbally in a wrestling business, this is how. Right. And, uh, so Oli, Oli and Gene, they were, they were a no flash tag team, but they drew money in, in Georgia and the Carolinas for years. And people always say, well, why didn't the Anderson brothers go anywhere else? They were so good. And it was much same as Lawler in Memphis where they would have been stupid to go anywhere else. They were making so much money. And they were on top and drawing such big houses in the the Carolinas and Virginia and Georgia that they didn't need to go anywhere else for for years, years at a time. Hey, whatever happened to Gene Anderson? Uh, Gene passed away. Gosh, it's been probably the late 90s. But, you know, Gene, uh, he he was the original Anderson brother. And after he had to retire, he I believe I want to say he had a stroke. Uh, yeah. But he he always had the twitch, the Gene Anderson twitch, which just added to his character. He had a muscular twitch in his neck. But he uh, he segued from in the ring to a manager for Crockett and then later on worked in the office. He's the guy that ran local promos every Wednesday. He he would travel to the towns and um, still, you know, even when he was out of the ring, even to the day he died, he had incredible grip strength. I mean, not close to Danny Hodge 
not Danny Hodge like, but he had incredible grip strength and he knew the pressure points. And I've seen him take the barbarian with his middle finger and his thumb and grip the barbarian. He would come up to guys and just grip them on the elbow and he knew where to get it. Right. He would have the barbarian down on his knees saying, please, Gene, please, Gene. <laughs> and Gene would say, tell me you're a faggot. Tell me you're a faggot. I'm a faggot. <laughs> please let me go. This is the Steve Austin Show. Jesus. Hey, is there any truth to this? Uh, I was at WCW at the time, and, and Dusty had the book. And I don't know if you know this or not, that when uh, Dusty was going to make, uh, what was it, Big Tugboat Taylor? Uh, Fred? Typhoon. Fred Typhoon. Ott. Yeah, Fred Ott. He was going to make him the, the shock master. And then they did the <laughs> deal on the, pa- was it was it the pay-per-view or was it the television? <laughs> Well, actually, it was even worse. It was live on, and free on TV where everybody could yeah, see Yeah, live, it. free on TV. And anyway, Shockmaster, uh, however, whatever happens, he trips and falls through the wall and blows the, uh, the, the big you know, unveiling of his character. But was it Ole Anderson indeed the voice of the Shockmaster? Uh, well, you know, he may have been. I know he was the voice of the Black Scorpion right. for the, all that yep. time because that, that was one of the more ill-thought-out uh, – you know, angles where they, they had a black scorpion that they were going to unveil and they actually didn't know who the black scorpion was going to be from one moment to the next. But the story that I got, I had I had left by then, but the story that I got was that the shock master with that helmet on and that elaborate outfit was going to burst through the wall on that segment and just make a big entrance. And they made the wall break away, but what they didn't do, uh, didn't tell Shockmaster or anybody else after the run through, there was an actual solid board that was about a foot off the ground that they had reinforced the wall with, and he could have stepped over it had he known. But since he didn't know, (laughs) he busted through the breakaway wall, but the board that was a foot off the ground tripped him like a tripwire, you know, a jungle booby trap, and he goes face first, and his helmet rolls off, and he falls on his ass. And I think that was a flare for the gold, the flare interview segment, and wasn't it Arn that you could hear? It may have been Arn, but somebody in the background was going, he goddamn fell on his ass. That was Davy Boy. The, the, was the microphone Boy. was yeah. picking up Davy Boy. He fell flat on his ass. He fell flat yes. on his fucking ass. And yeah, then you can hear Sid, oh, God. And then Sid <laughs> starts over-talking him, and then it's a, ter- it's a total verbal clusterfuck because they're out of sync, but they're continuing to go forward. It's live television. I remember it going down. I was there. I remember when I got back. I mean, I've watched that a clip on YouTube so many times it's probably in my opinion it's the funniest thing that I've ever seen in, in on a wrestling program yeah and boy you talk about it, it, people try to force comedy in wrestling but you know in this case it was very unintentional and that's the best comedy sometimes and uh, but an organic comedy is the best but that was certainly not planned but yeah I remember as a matter of fact now that you mentioned it, it was Davy Boy because I was doing the accent and attributing yeah. it but oh my god he fell on his fucking ass it was davy with that thick manchester <laughs> accent i'm talking to jim Cornette here out of all the stuff that that you've done i mean you've been on the road for damn ever uh with um, you know obviously you know with all the, the stuff that you've done in wwe wcw nwa smoky mountain blah 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 what's some of the most fucked up shit you've seen jim just in, in the name of uh uh just fans doing stuff Shit going wrong in the ring. Just, just total. Give me some clusterfuck stories. Oh my God, I, I can tell you right off the top of the, the my head. Uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, one night, Mid South oh. Wrestling. It's Barton Coliseum. It's the midnight yep. in the rock and roll. And right, and and at this, and you point, guys got to be on fire, right? And we're on fire. Rock and roll. It's sold out, yep. and we go to the ring first, and here comes the rock and roll, and they bring the lights down, and they hit the Van Halen music. They were using Jump at the time yep. as their intro because that was the hot song, and they drop the lights, and they put a spotlight on the stage. So here comes out of the Barton Coliseum locker rooms, you come up these stairs onto this big stage. And that at the end of the arena, and then you come off the end of the stage, down the stairs, and down the middle aisle to the ring. Well, here comes Ricky and Robert, and the shrieks from the teeny boppers are deafening, and yes. the the spotlight is playing all over it, and the people are going crazy. And 
Hoot Gibson, Robert Gibson, Punky and Hoot for everybody. If you don't know who Punky and Hoot are, you're you're not right. uh, involved in the wrestling business. Ricky's Punky and Robert's Hoot. And th- they come up. Hoot had his issues sometimes <laughs> with with stepping places he shouldn't step. <laughs> so they come up on this stage and they're in the spotlight and the people are going crazy. But of course, the spotlight in their eyes, the only light in the arena, they can't really see. So they're going on. They're going on, we need to move forward. That's the only thing they knew. Well, we're watching in the ring, me and Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry, and Ricky comes to the front of the stage and starts coming down those stairs to come down the middle aisle. And Hoot, the the spotlight got in his eyes. And it was a T-shaped stage. And he walked off the corner of the stage, not being able to see, and just dropped out of sight. Just a complete like an elevator had just taken him down and fell off the front of the stage. And then you see a hand come up and boom. And we, oh, my God, Hoot's fallen again. There was another time um, uh, the Heavenly Bodies in Smoky Mountain Wrestling were working with, with Doug and Mike Furness. Now, Doug Furness was a UT football star, was the God. legitimately set world strongman records. Unbelievable and talent. Running his back brother. Running University of yes. Tennessee. Yep. His, his brother, Mike was also a football player at UT, but did not get all of the athletic genes of the furnace family. Right. So Doug had called us and said, Hey, my brother, Mike wants to get into wrestling. And if you guys will train him, I'll come out. Cause he was living in California at the time. I'll come out and make the Christmas week shows for you. Cause Christmas was always a huge time for wrestling. So, okay. So we trained Mike for, Gosh, six or eight weeks. And then finally it came. We shot the angle where Mike Furness debuted in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, but the Heavenly Bodies got on him and beat him up. And here comes Doug, and we're going to have the tag match Christmas night, I believe it was 1993 in Knoxville, Heavenly Bodies and the Furnace Brothers. And Doug, being the experienced veteran, he said, I'll sell and I'll give Mike the tag, right? So he sold his ass off for the Heavenly Bodies for like 10 minutes or so, and finally he hits that hot tag to Mike Furness, and Mike was so excited, and there's 2,500, 3,000 people in his hometown. They just blew. Oh, my God, here comes Mike, and Tom Pritchard is in the ring, and Mike stepped through the ropes and ran at Tom and jumped and hit him with a flying clothesline. Boom! And Tom takes a big bump, and Mike, he ran so hard and so fast when he leaped up in the air and hit that clothesline he landed and kept rolling and rolled right out of the other side of the ring (laughs) so he literally was in the ring for three seconds he leaped up hit the clothesline landed and rolled out to the floor and there's jimmy del rey going i'm ready to feed there wasn't nobody to feed for and tom gets up and then all of a sudden you see a hand from the other side of the ring mike but so the people went yeah (laughs) <laughs> much like dutch mantel one time in tupelo mississippi at dutch was the only when i was younger i was very fast and dutch was the only baby face that could catch me in the memphis territory he was he was quicker than a hiccup boy and dutch. he would chase me around the ring and just wear me out like i was about to turn into butter and finally he'd catch me and he'd give me an ass bump or do whatever the fuck well in Tupelo, Mississippi, the old sports arena down there used to be a, an auto body shop, and there was still grease on the floor, and it had rained that night, and everybody had brought the water in. And I had rubber-treaded soles on my dress shoes because I didn't want to bust my ass, you know, on the slick concrete arenas. Well, I saw him about to slide out, and I start flat-footing it around the ring to get ahead of him. And as he slides out under the rope to, to chase me, and I start going around the ring kind of flat-footed, running as fast as I could, I got halfway around the ring and looked around and Dutch wasn't behind me. And I looked out and I saw a hand coming up. (laughs) You know, it's always bad when you see one hand coming up. He had slid out there and hit that oil, that wet oil on that floor and wiped out the first row ringside. (laughs) And, and I'll tell you one more and then we'll get off this subject. The biggest fuck ups in Memphis entrances were a big deal back in the old days. Oh yeah. And Lawler started it. He came out on a white horse, and he was lowered from the ceiling. And, I mean, he had all these elaborate entrances. Well, one night they had a 10-man tag team match. It was going to be Jackie Fargo, Stan Lane, and Steve Kern, the original Fabulous One, and his team, the Fabulous Ones, teaming up with Bill Dundee and Jerry Lawler to go against five of Jimmy Hart's heels. And they even promoted on the the Memphis Wrestling Show that Saturday morning, said, wait till you see the entrances, folks, because that was a big deal back then. And so 
I remember that that I think they even flipped a coin as to what order the baby faces would come out in. But the heels are standing there in the ring waiting, and we're all in the back watching. And the Lawler comes out. I think he was he was either riding a white horse or being carried on his throne. And here come Fargo and the fabulous ones in a stretch limousine playing their rock and roll music with the spotlights. And Dundee had chosen a motorcycle. Oh. And once again, a spotlight came into play. He started out, and 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 Jerry Jared had told him, "Now, now, Bill, <laughs> you know, be careful with that thing, right? Oh, don't worry, mate." So <laughs> the music, cue the Australian accent. Yeah. Don't worry, mate. It'll be fine. I can ride a mo Well, he could ride a motorcycle if he had the power of sight, but once again, a spotlight came into play as he revs up and starts coming down the aisle on this motorcycle in the Memphis, mid South Coliseum. Once again, the spotlight hit him in the eyes and he couldn't see, and he lost control and hit a wet spot and slid, and from where all of us in the back, all the heels on the heel side were watching, it looked like people were dying, right? Because he wiped out, and they were playing Wipeout. That was his entrance music. Oh, no. <laughs> he wiped out in that motorcycle and slid up under the front row, and you just saw women just fucking flying and people screaming, and he wiped out. Fortunately, nobody was hurt badly, but he wiped out the whole front row and he got up and then they had the 10 man tag and it was like eight, 9,000 people in the building. And then the limousine was Jerry Jarrett's. He had, he had ridden down there and Sputnik Monroe's son Bubba was his limo driver at the time. And Dundee had written because he was the booker, I believe at the time down with Jerry Jarrett from, from Nashville. So on the way back, Jerry Jarrett got in the back and locked the door and made Dundee right up front with Bubba Monroe. At about halfway to, to, to Nashville after the matches, <laughs> Dundee made Bubba pull over and he got out and he was knocking on the door and Jerry Jarrett wouldn't let him in. He was he didn't talk to him for several days after that. <laughs> so, but he he went ahead and wrestled the, the match and he wasn't hurt. Oh yeah, you had to have the match. I don't know if he was hurt or not, but he wasn't going to sell it publicly. I've always heard that Sputnik Monroe was a tough son of a bitch. Is that true? You want me to tell you the truth, or you want me to lie to you? Well, I, yeah, shoot straight up. Sputnik was tough in a wrestling context, in that he would take the hard ways and he would take the bumps, and nothing was going to fucking prevent Sputnik Monroe from trying to steal the show and have the match of the night. But as far as probably as. as he he was a tu he he fought when he was young in the carnivals and he got in that way as far as wrestling he probably couldn't have tied a knot much less tied up anybody into a knot but he had that personality and so as far as as actual wrestling was concerned no he was not going to give Danny Hodge any runs for his money as far as just being a tough old crusty bastard that that fought and wrestled in carnivals and took on all comers and and was a guy who if it needed a hard way was was you know was right there for it yeah he was a tough son of a gun but sputnik was was more uh, <laughs> when you met sputnik monroe he, he would shake your hand he'd say how you doing nice to meet you sputnik monroe world's greatest wrestler sputnik Ran monroe the diamond ring and cadillac man there is an entire chapter in uh, in my book that I sent you, Rags, Paper, and Pens, yep. available at jimcornette.com, about Sputnik Monroe. He still holds legendary status in Memphis. His boots and robe are on display at the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum, uh, not only because he still to this day, despite Jerry Lawler breaking the uh, consecutive sellout record in the Mid-South Coliseum that Elvis Presley set, despite wow. Lawler being the king of wrestling in Memphis, Still to this day, the most people ever to see a wrestling match in the city of Memphis, Tennessee, came to see Sputnik Monroe and his match with Billy Wicks at Russwood Park in 1959. His program with Billy Wicks, the hometown hero, was so hot. And that's when they first got Memphis TV, the, the Memphis TV that's recognized as the lineage up to the to the glory days. Um, it was so hot they were doing ballpark shows. Uh, in the summertime on a regular basis to handle the people. And they sold out at 13,000 some, but so many other people were trying to get in that they broke the outfield fences down and the police and newspaper estimates were all, over 17, almost 18,000 people in the park to see the, the blow off match between Sputnik Monroe and Billy Wicks. And Sputnik also is credited and with very good reason for integrating uh, sporting events in the South, because back in those days, Memphis was, was subject to segregation. 
uh, in the Ellis Auditorium, the black fans had to sit in what they called, and this is the reason why it became known that, the crow's nest. Right. Um, and, and, you know, Memphis wrestling was going through a down period when Sputnik came in. And the crowds were down. And Sputnik instantly realized that there was a massive audience that was not being tapped. And so what would he do? He put on his purple suit and his felt hats and his, his diamond tipped cane. And he went down to Beale street and he was arrested for drinking in the Negro cafes. That's what they called them at the time because Beale street was completely black. Right. It wasn't a tourist attraction like it is today. And they called them Negro cafes and the cops would go in and arrest him. And his crime was drinking with black people. And so that he would do that and he would get arrested. He was the first white man in the city of Memphis's history to go to court and be represented by a black attorney. Um, they arrested him on charges of mopery, which is an old Southern vagrancy term. Wow. And he would defend him. He had the black attorney to defend him and he would pay a fine and it would make the newspapers. So eventually the black citizens in Memphis said, you know, we don't care if he's a heel. We love this guy. He's, he, he, he loves us and we love him. And so it got to the point where the downstairs ringside and downstairs would be half full if that, but they'd be turning them away yeah. from the crow's nest. And the smart money says that Roy Welch, the promoter, had something to do with this, but he let the heel take the fall. But regardless of how a good thing got done, they ended up segreg uh, desegregating Memphis wrestling to where that the black folks and the white folks could sit in the same locations and they didn't have any riots. And as a result of that, it spread to the other sports. So Sputnik, oh, Monroe, for damn. all of those contributions is commemorated in the Memphis Rock and Soul Museum as as for his part in not only being a cultural icon in Memphis, but also desegregating sporting events in, in West Tennessee. Oh. And one more Sputnik story. You're going to love this. Oh, Greg, go for it. After he'd drawn the biggest record crowd in the history of Memphis wrestling and after he had, had boxed Jersey Joe Walcott and after he'd wrestled a bear, he said, what else can I do to get some publicity? <laughs> so Sputnik's hometown was Dodge City, Kansas. And that's how he was introduced. And at the time in 1959, 1960, one of the big hit Western shows on TV was Bat Masterson. And Gene Barry, the actor, played Bat Masterson, who was allegedly the sheriff of Dodge City, Kansas, in, in the program. So Sputnik got the idea that since Gene Barry was going to make an appearance at the Mid-South Fair and Rodeo that year, that he would go to the Mid-South Fair and Rodeo. He would go up on stage, crash the party, and, and punch Gene Barry in the nose and, and, and get on the front page of the paper. Well, he, he went, and, and, and of course, now some people say alcohol was involved. Right. But he went to the, to the Mid-South Fair and Rodeo, and there was such a, a jam-packed crowd, and there was such security, he couldn't get anywhere near Gene Barry. But in the process of being there, he somehow made the wrong remark to this cowboy from up in Paris, Tennessee, that was there for the rodeo. And once again, the stories differ and alcohol was involved, but apparently the cowboy decked Sputnik anywhere from one to nine times. Now, <laughs> and this story is in my book also. Because it was in the it was covered in the newspapers at the time. The next day, the newspapers had pictures of Sputnik with this big bloused eye and and the stitches. Sputnik runs afoul of cowboy at fair, you know, decked nine times or whatever. <laughs> now Sputnik's story was that he he got in a fight with this guy because he said the wrong thing about either a horse or a woman. We're not sure what. And while he was handing off his brand new Hamburg hat, the guy sucker punched him. And then he slipped in horse manure trying to get up and the guy hit him again. But regardless, Sputnik Monroe, the top heel in, in wrestling, got beat up by some unknown cowboy. So Roy Welch oh. and his son, Buddy Fuller, who was the matchmaker, trying to make a positive out of a negative, challenged the cowboy to come down to the Ellis Auditorium that following Monday night. And they'd pay him $1,500 if he'd get in the ring with Sputnik again. Well, now the cowboy figured I'm being set up. This whole thing has been a work. I'm being set up. They're going to kill me. So he didn't show up. <laughs> so Sputnik and the cowboy sold out the Ellis Auditorium for a match that was never going to happen to begin with. And they brought somebody else in that they said was from Paris, Tennessee, that was a friend of the cowboys. And Sputnik beat him and got all his heat back. <laughs>
And at the time, oh, Jesus Christ. commercial appeal on a daily basis, because everybody in town, you can go back to that period of time, the late fifties, early sixties. And Sputnik's gimmick was he had a, a bleached blonde spot in the front of his hair. Yeah. You can go back in high school yearbooks and, and at that time, and a lot of the guys in, in like 11th, 12th grade, had bleach blonde spots in in the in the front of their head because Sputnik was their hero. He was the hero of the the teenage guys, yeah. And and, and all of the, the the black fans, and he used to say, he said the the white people may not like me, and the establishment may not like me, but all those people, their black maid that's raising their kids, they love me. So I've got the kids, and I got the blacks, and that's all I need. I'll be damned. And to this day, if you mention the name Sputnik Monroe in Memphis, you know, second only to Jerry Lawler, you you will instantly, everybody knows who you're talking about. Hey, I always heard Dickie Slater was pretty tough. Did you ever uh, cross in the same territory with him, uh, or was this more in his Mid-South run? No, I sure didn't. He, Yes, he was tough. He knocked, uh, who was it he knocked out? John Matuzic one time? When was that? Uh, it was in a bar somewhere. <laughs> but he was just a good old boy, but he was, I mean, and he, he wasn't the biggest guy in the world, uh, certainly a good-sized guy, but I heard that some bitch was just tougher than nails. He he was tough, and, and you know, I crossed paths with him, and as a matter of fact, when he was the booker, and when, when Jim Crockett Promotions bought the Georgia Territory in 1985, uh, you know, after the whole thing with Vince taking the TV, and uh, I mean, we could go on about that, but basically Crockett bought Atlanta in 85 and and he had a crew in Atlanta and had a crew in Charlotte for about six months before he combined them and we had just come from Dallas and started working there and Dusty was the booker of the whole schmear and he gave orders that uh, the Midnight Express is going to go over every night with uh, even Bob Eaton and Dennis Condor they even split battle royals as heels that's they we were not defeated nobody touched me right because he was saving it for the rock and roll in himself well Dick Slater was the booker in Atlanta, and he and Buzz Sawyer one night, I guess it was in in Charleston, West Virginia, uh, decided to go Broadway 30 minutes with the midnight. And, of course, you know, afterwards, we did what we were told, but afterwards, Dennis said, you know, that ain't right. Dusty said we were supposed to go over. He's got big plans for us. You better call the office, Corny. (laughs) So so I called the office and checked to see you, and, oh, we didn't know about this. We'll take care of it because what we didn't know was they were about to fire Dick Slater and they were about to fire Buzz Sawyer and they were about to fire all the guys that, you know, and, and bring their own crew everywhere. So we show up at the next town somewhere in Ohio the next night. And, uh, I got a couple of hot dogs, right? Cause I was starving and I got a couple of hot dogs and I just sat down in the locker room, start to eat them. And Slater comes in and says, Cornette, I need to see you. I'm like, Oh shit. <laughs> And I finished my hot dogs. He's like, you may not want to. I'm shitting, right? I'm, and the, the, Dennis and Bobby said, we're, we're right outside. Go talk to him, whatever. What is he going to prove he's, how tough he is by beating me up, right? He's, so he called the office on me. I said, Dick, all I can tell you is that Dusty told us this is what's going to happen. And, and, you know, we were calling to check and make sure because it was contrary to what we were told, right? And I'm like, oh, God. And he said, well, I know what's going on and I know what they're doing, but you know, I didn't know what we were coming back with and why beat us and why beat you. We just went Broadway. I said, well, Hey, we're, we're here to do whatever. So I was shaking like a dog shit and peach seeds, but Slater was a tough son of a gun and, and everybody knows the story was sting and I like sting and I don't mean to embarrass him publicly, but if you don't know it, I'll tell it to you. I've heard the story, but not a very good description of the story. What the hell happened? Basically, what happened, Slater and Dark Journey were a couple in the UWF, and Sting was an innocent victim in this because Slater and Dark Journey broke up, and so Slater wasn't about to give her a ride to the town, but she was still on the card, so some way she asked poor Sting, hey, can I ride with you? And they come in together, and somebody went over in the heel locker room and told Slater, hey, Dark Journey just came in with Sting, and Slater got mad and at the time you didn't do this busted across the building into the baby face locker room and fucking uh basically grabbed sting and fl- gave him the the fucking flush thing what he pushed him out and flushed his head in the toilet a few times 
and uh, and nobody stopped him, including Sting or anybody else, because <laughs> what the fuck with Dick Slater. Yeah. <laughs> What was the deal? Hey, that would you know that when you brought up Dark Journey, the the, the feud with her and Missy Hyatt was uh, it was gold for me. The loaded Gucci bag, those are some badass cat fights. Did you dig all that action back in? Yeah, you know because back then it it wasn't about you know the the divas having their little you know four minutes. I'm not trying to knock. It wasn't, it. No, 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 no. Yeah, but but it, it was it was just like two chicks. Two, yeah, two chicks. I mean women. Uh, and and they weren't wrestlers; they were they were valets, uh, but women, and and they were getting into real deal badass cat fights, and that was some quote unquote real shit. Yeah, and, and you when know, Missy it, Hyatt was it was it Missy Hyatt that had the loaded Gucci bag because she had oh, the money. Yes. So Missy oh yes, yeah. I mean the loaded Gucci bag was over with me because I just knew that some bitch had a brick in that motherfucker. Yeah, and and that's the thing is that there's nothing worse. There's nothing worse than having pretty women try to to do professional wrestling. Because I'm not being sexist here, but I saw Stacy Keebler one time. She took a kick to the gut, and her legs were so long, and she was so thin. When she bent over to sell it, she got she got off balance and just fell. Didn't fall down. Just staggered backwards all the way across the ring and almost fell through the ropes. Um, you know, the, the old days of where, you know, moolah trained these salty females to fight, you know, is long gone. And there's nothing worse than seeing pretty women who can't wrestle, try to wrestle, but seeing pretty women who are going to have a cat fight and who really look like they mean it was money. And, and, you know, whether it be Missy Hyatt at dark journey and precious was part of that, that yeah. crowd, you know, yeah. and, and, and baby doll, my God. Yeah. Baby doll dislocated my jaw one time in St. Louis. What happened? Um, she was supposed to miss a slap. <laughs> <laughs> Did she connect on purpose? Well, but no, you know, she didn't really do anything on purpose. But Baby doll, people don't know this, was the the women's shot put champion in Lubbock High School shot put champion. Are and at the time me? that we were that we were working our deal in 1986 at the Great American Bashes, she was the same height as me, and had and I had about 10 pounds on her back then. And, you know, wh- what was I going to do? Complain that a girl is beating me up, but it was the girl and the manager, and, and she knocked me out, you know, we're in a working way every night around the territory. But one time we're in the cage in St. Louis, Dusty and Magnum on her side, and the midnight on my side, and... I'm supposed to swing or whatever. She's going to duck and she's going to swing a slap at me and I'm going to fall backwards on my ass and run from her, right? To show that I'm a big pussy. She connected (laughs) with that slap she wasn't supposed to connect with and knocked my jaw out of socket and came back in. I couldn't chew for three days. Oh, that sucks. That hurts when, when that happens. And another time in Raleigh, we're working with the Road Warriors, and Paul Ellering is supposed to be chasing me around the ring. And this was on television, so I have a great slow mo of this. She's supposed to run down the aisle way, and as Paul is chasing me, I'm supposed to turn around, and there she is. She's going to hit me with the big knockout punch, right? And it was the same deal as Paul Lee. Only Paul Lee couldn't hit as hard as she she did. But I always said, you know, hit me in the side of the head and just hit me because it's, it's got to look good, right? <laughs> well, the, the aisle way in Raleigh was a long-ass aisle way. Yep. You had to come a ways. And so I'm Paul's cha- and, and Bubba is my bodyguard and we you know, he's standing there, he's chasing Paul and Paul's chasing me. And I come around the corner and I see that baby doll is nowhere in sight. I figured, okay, I'll just make another loop. So I just made another loop around the ring. But, and as I, as I'm coming around the second time, I see she's almost there and I'm like, okay, I'll back up away from Paul. Now that I've got a little space on him and I'll turn around and she'll punch me. Well, she was so panicked that she missed her cue the first time. Instead of waiting for me to turn around, she just at a dead run punched me head on in the base of the skull. It felt like a mark had hit me with a chair and my <laughs> brains exploded. I saw the sparkly things and you see on TV, yeah. they put it back in slow-mo and I fall into Bubba's arms and Bubba's trying to catch me and I go down. And the first thing I remember is, oh, Bubba, big boss man saying, Jimmy, she hit you hard. <laughs> <laughs> but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, Jim. Well, let me stop you right there. I got to get this thing wrapped up. So let's pick this up next week. All right, everybody, I want to thank Jim Cornette. It's taken me, I don't know, a couple of weeks to finally record a session with him. All the bullshit troubles we went through, 
uh, the conversation that he had with the ghost. And my damn technology went shits on me, but you know, whatever the fuck. Finally got it down. You guys going to hear part two next week. It was great talking to Jim because this is a motor mouth motherfucker. I like talking to him. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of the Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Hey, Friday Night Lights fans. It's Not Only Football, Friday Night Lights and Beyond is an episode-by-episode discussion of the hit TV series Friday Night Lights, hosted by yours truly, Scott Porter, who played Jason 